Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be an acceptable offering to you, our rock and our redeemer. When I went to university and started at the tender age of 30, I enrolled in, I was initially going to be going for computer science. I'd spent almost a decade professionally in software, and I'd been interested in it for long before. Well, after the end of my first year, uh, as with some people who go to university, your, your first shot isn't exactly where you end up, and it became very clear that wasn't where God was calling me. So I looked at the Master of Divinity program at Emmanuel College down at the University of Toronto, and what you need to get in there is an undergraduate degree. They don't care what anymore. Okay, great, because you've got a lot of people who are coming second career. They've got a Bachelor of Engineering, a Bachelor of Sciences, Bachelor of Arts, all sorts of bachelors. You don't have to redo any of that. We'll, we'll take you as, we are, as you are, and we'll, we'll start there, okay? So I just need a BA. Pick something that's fun, something that's interesting. For me, that was cognitive science, which is the study of how our brains work. Uh, the motto for the course union was, are you thinking of a major? Why not major in thinking? They had some really catching lines. Now some people, when they do the cognitive science degree, it wasn't meant to be done alone. It's supposed to be a double major. So some people do a degree in cognitive science and philosophy. And they start thinking, okay, well what is thought? What is intelligence? What is Let's, let's see if we can figure out what all of this means. Some people do cognitive science and psychology. They really bear down on what we understand of how the brain works and how the mind works, and they look to refine therapy techniques that we might be using. Some people look at cognitive science and computer science. These people are generally going into artificial intelligence. How do we make computers think like us, act like us, so that they can help us a little bit more, rather than always flashing 12, 12, 12, 12. <laughs> and of course there are the people who do cognitive science and biology. Usually they're off to some sort of neuroscience, some sort of really deep understanding of, okay, if this part of the brain is compromised, what does that mean? And how can we work to heal it? Now, as I said, I was doing cognitive science more for the fun so I could get into uh, doing my Master of Divinity degree. But it was interesting, especially when I would meet with other people who were in the cognitive science program and, and saying to them, so what are you doing? Why are you studying cognitive science? And getting this plethora of responses back. The cognitive science really was an interdisciplinary program, one that attracted people from all sorts of different walks of life. I have to say I was probably the only theological person who was taking any courses, but that created some interesting conversations. People were coming to the program for all sorts of reasons. Now, there are other activities in everyday life where people come for all sorts of reasons. One of those that comes to mind is volunteering. People volunteer at places like Regen or at a, a thrift store or something for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, for some people, they may want to actually just support the cause, either as a frontline person who's sorting bookshelves or, or cooking meals, or maybe they feel they want to help with the administration and keep track of that. Some people, uh, they might be new to the area. What's a great way to meet other people who are in the area? Well, let's go volunteer. Some people, uh, they might be looking for job references. It's, it's easy to volunteer somewhere, get some good references rather than telling your boss, hey, I'm thinking of looking for another job. Can I put you down as a reference? <laughs> and for other people, it's something to do. Maybe they're out of school, out of work for a little bit. They've got something else lined up, but they've got maybe a couple of weeks in between jobs or something. And, they could sit around at home and do nothing all day, or they can get out and feel good about doing something. And they volunteer. All sorts of different reasons why people come to volunteer. 
Even coming to church here may be for a variety of reasons. And maybe it's something you've done all your life. It's Sunday morning, you go to church. What's the big deal? Other people, they may come to a particular church for something that that church is doing. Some people may come for an incredible music program. Some people may come uh, for the, the warm community, the warm welcome that they receive when they come here and, and the support, the friendships that they make. Other people may come because they want to be involved in some sort of social action. They, they want to make the world a better place. They, they see homeless people and they think, ah, this can't be right. What can I do about it? And they go to a church thinking, maybe I can do something there. But with people coming for all sorts of different reasons, and I don't think we have anyone uh, wearing a shirt saying, I'm here for, it can lead to interesting discussions. Should we fund roof repair, or should we fund an outreach program? Should we pay money to help to, to keep some gift certificates on site for people who are coming by asking for groceries? Or should we buy a new camera so that we can stream our worship better? And you'll find people who are on both sides of this discussion. Should we get a new organ, or should we get cushions for the pews? <coughs> and even, even within that, there's, there's all sorts of differences. When we, do, when we think about doing outreach, is that funding a local mission somewhere, something like regeneration, or is that doing advocacy? Writing letters, picketing parliament. None of us have to skip school, I don't think. There, there's all of these things, and people are coming to church for different reasons, and it can sometimes lead to this strife when people don't agree, when people have different reasons for being here. The early church had similar strife. Most of the letters that Paul wrote were to specific churches saying, hey guys, I hear you have this problem. Put a stop to it. Come together. But the church in Jerusalem, that very first church that we were talking about last week, the church that Peter founded, that's always been held up as kind of the model church. This was a good church. This is what church should look like. And we hear more about that in the second chapter of Acts. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. These are, these are marks of the church. This is the mark of church activity. Listening to what's being taught, to fellowship with one another, to sharing in meals, not just the, the sacramental meal of the Lord's Supper, but in just regular meals, regular dinner, regular lunch. And, of course, prayer, lifting one, lifting each other up in prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Now, it's interesting that the word awe there that we see, the Greek for that is the word phobos, from which we get phobia, right? Claustrophobia. And you hear that fear of God, that really troubling way that we think of God. We're supposed to fear the Lord. It's the beginning of all knowledge. It might be helpful to think that these early Christian followers, like the people who had the fear of God, they understood the stakes. They understood what was at stake here. A new community. A new way of being together. And because they understood the stakes, not out of terror, not, not out of being scared, but having that understanding 
Because of that, the apostles were able to perform miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. This concern for one another's well-being. If I'm blessed with something, let me share that blessing with you. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. There's an image here of an Old Testament idea, the idea of jubilee. A, 50, a once in 50 year celebration where all of Israel was commanded to forgive all the debts, just start over again from scratch. If you had bought someone else's property, you were supposed to just give it back to them. If someone had sold themselves to become your slave, they were let go. It was a very important concept. And here, in Acts, we see that happening again because of this new community that the Spirit has inaugurated. A community built on Jubilee. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Especially that last line there. The Lord added to their fellowship. Because this creation of a new kingdom it's not all on us. God wants to partner with us. Now, God isn't going to do it all for us. We do have to put in a bit of legwork, but we're not on our own. We're working in partnership with God, and God wants to grow communities of faith, communities where people come together to celebrate this jubilee idea, this idea where we can all support one another, where we share with, out of our wealth with one another. In the Song of Faith, there's a, a section that says, In the church, some are called to specific ministries of leadership, both lay and ordered. Some witness to the good news. Some uphold the art of worship. Some comfort the grieving and guide the wandering. Some build up the community of wisdom. And some stand with the oppressed and work for justice. We understand that people come from all different lived theologies, as Janet Geer would call it. All different ways that God calls to them in their lives, and that call is answered concretely. But Janet Geer says that even though we have all of these wonderful gifts, and they are all wonderful, they can sometimes be taken to extremes. And when we hit these extremes, we need to help one another. Some of us come for, for the gatherings, but maybe they get a little too isolated, a little too, or sorry, maybe they get a little too consumer-oriented. Does worship enliven us, or is it something we do? And so Janet says that we need to involve evangelical faith. And I'm not talking about the people who are going out saying, hey, you've got to believe in Jesus or else. But I'm talking about that shared story, that wonderful jubilee story that Jesus comes to share with us. That new kingdom with jubilee expectations where everyone will have what they need. But even that can be taken too far. It can become a little too exclusive. Either you're one of us or you're not. And sometimes we need to crack that. People who are coming to work in mission, to take the church out into the streets, need to share their ministry. Now, it's very easy to help individual people and feel like they're always just treading water, not making any real difference. In that case, we need to involve people who come with advocacy, who want to deal with the root problems of society, wealth inequity, racism, homophobia. Sometimes they get a little burnt out because they write all the letters. They, they participate.
participate in all the marches. And they wonder, is anything ever happening? They sometimes need some spiritual help just to ground themselves again. Help them to realize that they don't have to do all the work. God is there to partner with them. And of course, all of that spiritual work, it can start to feel very lonely. It can start to feel very one-on-one -on -one with God and people in the spiritual work, they need to join with the community. A community that gathers. A community that needs ecclesial support, that needs missional support, that needs ecumenical advocacy support, that needs spiritual support. All of these gifts coming together, and it's not so much butting heads, but they're all called to support one another, just like we heard of that early community in Acts. People with these characteristics, they're all called by Jesus to come in through Jesus, through that sacrament of baptism, to become a part of the community, a full part of the community, whether you've been here for two weeks, whether you've been here for 50 years, to fully participate and be a part of the community. And when we're able to support each other, then we have that abundant, that rich and satisfying life that Jesus promises to us. We need all of these views or there's an imbalance. And the purpose of the church gets thrown out of whack. But when we have them all together, we realize that arguments between funding the roof or funding roof repairs or doing outreach, maybe it can be both. Maybe in doing outreach, we can get some grant money that'll help us fund the roof. Or maybe, maybe when we're thinking about should we be writing letters about homelessness or actually helping homeless people, we realize, hey, we, we can do both. And the stories, those first-hand stories that we get from our missional outreach, we can use in our ecumenical letter writing. And all sorts of other ways that we can support one another that we can work together with our gifts and that we can support and care for our neighbors who are here in this room. And our ecclesial gatherings become more than just Sunday morning. There's something that we've lived every day of the week. The evangelical good news isn't just for those who agree with us. It's for everyone. Missional action doesn't become overwhelming and ecumenical partnership doesn't lead to that burnout. And the spiritual work, it's not cheap into bypasses, but it's embedded in community. And we have all of these working together, rather than separately, but working together. Then we have that rich, that abundant life, that jubilee living that Jesus invites us to, the gate is open. The shepherd is calling. Are we willing to walk through? Are we willing to offer of what we have so that we can, our gifts can be used for the good of the kingdom, for the good of everyone, to bring that beautiful vision of jubilee living into our lives? Jesus is calling. Are we ready to answer? Let me pray for you. God of Easter renewal, we confess that we know that we come here for a variety of reasons, and yet sometimes we don't know why other people are here. We give thanks that you come and you call us. You have called us all with our different skills, our different gifts, our different talents, our different lived theologies that we can contribute to life in the kingdom. God, help us to break down barriers that divide. Help us to come together so that we can serve you, so we can turn our gifts to your service, to building your kingdom, to preparing that feast here on earth. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.